Brazil is a passionate country. The combination of innate rhythm and dance makes Brazil famous for music and football. The South American giant regularly turns out elegant players that score goals, turn matches and thrill fans. Brazil has won five World Cups, more than any other country, and iconic names like Pelé do not overshadow current Brazilian players such as Robinho, who debuted at Santos, winning two Confederation Cups with Brazil. Ronaldinho, one of the most gifted of the current generation of players. And Ronaldo, nicknamed the Phenomenon, who won the FIFA Player of the Year award three times. But during the last decade, one player has emerged, establishing a reputation as a playmaker that continues to build. Kaká. Bernabeu Stadium was packed for his presentation. Real Madrid had paid a record transfer fee in excess of 60 million euros. Ricardo Isaacson dos Santos Leite, Kaka, a legend in the making. Kaka was born in Brazil's capital, Brasilia. He had a secure upbringing with parents Bosco and Simone and younger brother De Gayo. When Kaká was seven years old, the family moved to the sprawling metropolis of Sao Paulo. In Sao Paulo, he played football for neighborhood club Alphaville. When the team made the final, scouts from the professional club Sao Paulo spotted the young Kaká and offered an assignment. His younger brother De Gayo showed promise too and later was also offered assignment to the club. Although Kaká showed early skill with a round ball, he was fond of many sports, including swimming. Tragically, this attraction to the water led to a life-changing setback. A badly executed dive into a swimming pool resulted in a spinal fracture. The potential superstar faced the prospect of life in a wheelchair. The teenaged Kaká vowed that if he recovered completely, he would dedicate his life to his god. This was the start of his emblematic pointing to heaven. At 15, he signed a formal contract with Sao Paulo. And at 17, he made his professional debut, going on to score 12 goals from 27 appearances in his first season. European talent scouts were watching, and soon he was wearing the red and black of Italian football powerhouse AC Milan. Now he was training with the big boys, and it would only take one month before he found his way into the starting lineup. He met the challenge. In his first season, Kaká scored 10 goals in 30 appearances for the Rosaniere. AC Milan had paid Sao Paulo an 8.5 million euro transfer fee. Next season, though, Milan lost that year's Champions League final to Liverpool. Kaká was voted the best midfielder of the tournament, and everyone was taking notice of the young Brazilian. Manager Carlo Ancelotti used him as part of the five-man midfield, usually playing behind striker Andrzej Shevchenko. Ancelotti said Kaká reminded him of Platini, part of the Magic Square, the French national team's midfielders from the 80s, that combined with devastating effect. Brazilians said that Kaká played like greats such as Rey, Zico or Rivaldo, and Pelé said he was the new Johan Cruyff. Fans now realized that with Kaká, AC Milan had a rising star. Glamour players with crowd appeal are valuable assets. Not only do they win games, they sell merchandise. Kaká was great. 
Inzaghi was great. Everybody was great. Fans were buying Milan shirts emblazoned with the name Kaka, and a lot more of his time was taken up by off-field functions. AC Milan president and Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi described Kaka's 8.5 million euro transfer fee as peanuts. I've never seen a player so young do the things he does for us. With the acclaim came new responsibilities, but there were new opportunities for the young Brazilian as well. Milanello, 50 kilometers north of Milan, is the club's training center. Regarded as Europe's premier sporting facility, it has six different pitches and a state-of-the-art gymnasium. The most brilliant players are worth nothing if they are sidelined through injury, so the club's fitness team use a training and monitoring program called Milan Lab. They monitor players' physical condition and can protect players returning from injury by specially tailoring their training regimen. The system enhances match strategy by ensuring that the maximum number of squad members are available for selection. Milan's system means fewer physical problems across the whole squad. It has a predictive function that indicates when particular players should be rested. At the time, Rui Costa was in his 30s. His long footballing career meant he required special handling. And the arrival of Kaká at Milan often meant Costa was relegated to the bench. The club still puts emphasis on traditional fitness work and skills training, but AC Milan aims to reduce the number of injuries, improve the management of players' health, and make training programs more efficient. In the season that Kaká started with AC Milan, Andre Shevchenko was the team's leading goal scorer. He was enthusiastic about the difference the total training system was making to his game. Yes, I can play more games, and I'm better prepared for each game. That's the important thing. Everybody can play more games. But what is important is how they play. This fastidious attention to player fitness from the very beginning of his career at the top level was to be hugely important to the young Kaká. Toward the end of Kaká's first season with AC Milan, the team was training hard. In the Serie A, they were near the top of the table. They just had to defeat Roma to win the Scudetto. The city of Milan celebrated in its typical, unrestrained manner. When he arrived at Milan, it was thought that Kaká would substitute for playmaker Andreo Perlo. But the Brazilian forced his way into the starting lineup, and Carlo Ancelotti included both as attacking midfielders. The shield helped heal the wound left by the club's quarter-final elimination in the Champions League. And the Rossonieri fans were desperate for glory. This was the club's 17th Scudetto and it would take Milan several days to return to business as usual. We are invincible. We have been unlucky in the Champions League, but we got our payback with winning the Italian title. Winning Serie A meant that Rossignere progressed directly to the UEFA Champions League group stage, and another chance at Europe's most prestigious trophy. For hours, central Milan was choked with supporters wanting to enjoy the team's national triumph. <laughs> July 2004, and AC Milan launched its new strip in New York. The team was in America for a World Series exhibition match against Manchester United. Kaká's success with the Rossonieri propelled him further into the spotlight towards duties in the publicity arena. The event held at Macy's Herald Square department store sold thousands of the new shirts, and Massimo Ambrosini, Hernan Crespo and Kaká were signing them.
Today, this type of shirt with a kaka signature is worth $1,000. The match against Manchester United was a one-all draw. Now the national team was calling. Brazil was lending its prestige in a friendly against war-torn Haiti. Built as the game for peace, manager Carlos Alberto Perea was keen to see what his young star could do during the very special match. I believe the Brazilian team has the opportunity to make history again, to stop a war, to make a beautiful example of solidarity and humanity. When the ball begins to roll, Brazil is going to have a great responsibility. What is important is that we have fun, more than playing with seriousness. We want to have a soccer game of happiness. The young Kaká now had a global profile, and games like this were just part of a new area of humanitarian work that was coming his way. In 2004, the United Nations asked Kaká to act as one of its World Food Program ambassadors. When they invited me to become part of this program, I was very happy because it's something that I can do. Often, people don't know how to help, even if they want to. Now, I know how to help, and I know the way I can help. My country also experiences this problem, and it's a powerful feeling to be able to help. The World Food Program is attempting to halve the number of hungry people around the world by 2015. Some 800 million people around the world suffer from hunger and malnutrition. 300 million of them are children. Kaká's devotion to his religion and his commitment to give 10% of his earnings to the church brought him to the attention of humanitarian organizations. His involvement in the UN World Food Program was a natural fit. Nowadays, football players are icons around the world and they can help in different ways. By mobilizing just one player or a number of players and by using their image, it's possible to unite people to fight hunger. More Brazilian duties for Kaká in 2005, this time in preparation for a World Cup qualifier against Peru. But Team Harmony had been badly disturbed. Gunmen had kidnapped the mother of teammate Robinho. To demonstrate their power, the kidnapper's first demand was that Robinho should stop playing. It was the first of five abductions of footballers' mothers, and all players were feeling uneasy. Many Brazilian players have come from impoverished backgrounds, and the success that lifts them out of poverty can create jealousy amongst those left behind. Held for 41 days, Marina de Silva Souza was finally released after Robinho had paid a $75,000 ransom. Eventually, police managed to arrest the culprits. It worries all of us. Those of us that have family here are worried 24 hours a day. We hope that this wave passes so that we can all live in peace. What precautions do you take to make sure this doesn't happen to your family? We pray that nothing will happen. Over a five-month period, Sao Paulo strikers Grafite and Fabiano as well as goalkeeper Rogerio, all had their mothers kidnapped. Soon after, in 2005, Robinho left his local club Santos for a place with Real Madrid. When he moved to Spain, he took his extended family with him. It marked an increase in the movement of high-profile players from Brazil to Europe. Brazil won the World Cup qualifier against Peru with Kaká scoring the only goal in the 74th minute. June 2005, and Brazil was preparing for the next World Cup qualifier, this time against Paraguay, followed three days later with a game against traditional rival Argentina. The team went through a final session in Teresopolis, 100 kilometers from Rio de Janeiro. 
Brazil was second in the South American qualifying round standings with 24 points earned from 13 games, four points behind leader Argentina. Paraguay was placed fourth and had knocked Brazil out of Olympic qualification the previous year. Ultimately, Brazil beat Paraguay 4-1. But Argentina would not be so easy. The Brazilian team traveled to the Argentine capital, Buenos Aires, for the big game. The defeat of Paraguay meant that Brazil was just one point behind Argentina in the South American qualifiers. Winner of this match would take top position. Argentina had just suffered a 2-0 loss to Ecuador, and it was being said that the low-key approach they had taken to the game was to blame. Brazilian players felt that Argentina had been preparing for the big game against them and had underestimated Ecuador. Nobody would take this game for granted. Two teams that were seven times champions of the world have the obligation to put on a good show. I believe that this is the weight of the classification, that they put on a good show within a very good technical field. Kaká was now a key player, and reporters and fans were seeking him out. Without a doubt, this is the most important game of the qualifiers, an exciting game. It's worth the same as the three points against Paraguay, but this has a different taste. 50,000 people crammed the River Plate Stadium to watch Argentina triumph over Brazil 4-1. Next, Brazil traveled to Germany for the Confederations Cup. This was a first for Kaká, and Carlos Alberto Pereira had big plans for his young midfielder. After the impressive performance against Paraguay, Kaká, Ronaldinho, Robinho, and Adriano had become known as the fabulous four. The team was going through final drills at Leipzig Central Stadium before the first group match against European champions Greece. This tournament happens in the year before the World Cup finals and is generally viewed as a rehearsal for the big event. Adriano, Robinho and Juninho each scored goals in Brazil's 3-0 disposal of Greece. The road to the finals was not smooth, with Brazil losing one group game to Mexico. However, Argentina had eliminated Mexico in a penalty shootout during the semi-finals, and Brazil and arch-rivals Argentina were to face each other in the final. This would be a unique first Confederations Cup final between the two giants of the game in South America. Good work by the Fabulous Four meant that Brazil had an extra rest day and all their top players would be available for the final at the Waldat Stion in Frankfurt. Argentina were to go into the final without Javier Saviola, who picked up a red card. Adriano, Ronaldinho and Kaká all scored in Brazil's 4-1 victory. Late in 2005, crowds were gathering in a Sao Paulo street outside the evangelical Reborn in Christ church. Kaká was to marry his 18-year-old girlfriend, Caroline Silico. Around 600 guests were invited to the ceremony and the bride and groom traveled to the reception via helicopter. The couple met in 2002 while Caroline was still at school. Silico, whose mother represents fashion house Christian Dior, wore a Christian Dior dress, while Kaka, who has a contact with Armani, was in a Giorgio Rimane suit. Early in 2006, after a very brief honeymoon, Kaka was back with his Brazilian teammates. It was a World Cup year, and all attention was focused on the approaching tournament in Germany. The Swiss village of Weges had been selected as a quiet retreat for the team, but the Brazilian supporters transformed the chilly mountain resort. The team was preparing for a final warm-up match against New Zealand, and the Brazilian traveling circus put on a typical welcome. Training sessions were relayed live to Brazil, and every player would be scrutinized by an 800-strong media army. The match against New Zealand went according to plan, with a 4-0 victory to the Samba Kings. 
Back in South America, Brazilians were going wild with anticipation, and across Rio, a special form of street art was emerging. The colors green and yellow were everywhere, with banners and streamers adorning public spaces. Decorating the streets for the World Cup is a tradition and a form of entertainment in many Rio communities. Families, friends and neighbors all come together for what is a labor of love. And between different areas, there's a friendly rivalry in trying to present the best World Cup enhancements. For most Brazilians, the biggest party is not Carnaval, it's the World Cup. The country moves to the rhythm of the games. Business hours are adjusted so everyone can watch the matches and celebrate. Mother of two children, Gledas Porto, helped decorate her street. As an amateur cartoonist, she painted the players' faces on this wall. Residents all turn out to admire the work, and it draws communities closer. Neighborhoods collect funds and organize the decoration with everyone contributing according to their skills. Each street shows a different identity. Brazil has won the World Cup five times, more than any other nation. The theme in 2006 was six. It says, Road to the Sixth. At the resident's request, some streets are closed off for a night while painters move in to decorate. Pavement, walls and telephone poles are all used and in some cities there are formal competitions for the best work. There are dark stories regarding Brazil's World Cup adornments. In 1982, after Brazil was eliminated early, furious supporters went on the rampage, tearing down and burning decorations, and even making death threats. Caricatures of the players are a common theme, and billboard artists who usually paint advertising signs are happy to contribute with images of team heroes. Brazil is always regarded as a good prospect for World Cup glory. In 2006, lots of people had them as favourites to win. But although the team had made it through to the last 16, group wins against Croatia and Australia had not been convincing. Ronaldo had been quiet, and Kaká had scored the only goal against Croatia. Reporters were critical of star Ronaldinho, saying that he played his best football for his club side, Barcelona. The twice world player of the year had so far failed to live up to his reputation in Germany. Carlos Alberto Pereira was reluctant to name the lineup for the round of 16 game against Ghana, and it was obvious that he was thinking of changes. Though Brazil had beaten Japan easily, Nobody had been expecting the footballing superpower to be pushed so hard, so early in the finals tournament. The manager was expected to reshuffle his team, moving Ronaldinho into attack, which would be closer to the roles he plays for Barcelona. Then Juninho, who had been playing off the bench, could start in the midfield beside Kaká. There were other aspects to the way the tournament was unfolding that disturbed the Brazilians. A match between Portugal and the Netherlands had been played in a particularly aggressive manner. They were worried their superior skills could be neutralized by such rough play. It was played, it was too much violence. Football almost was not there. Normally all the games had been playing about 60 minutes of running ball. In, in that game, I think it was 16 yellow cards, four red cards, and I don't think the ball has moved more than 30 minutes. So it was not the ideal game for uh, a World Cup. Kaká was also asked about the spirit of the tournament. I think we are seeing good matches, but the beautiful game is being put aside. Everybody is looking for objectivity and efficiency. Nobody wants to play with finesse and then to go back home. From the matches I've watched, Argentina is a team that's playing well together, along with Spain, and I would also include Brazil. The game against Ghana was difficult. There were six yellow cards, with Asamoa Gyan from Ghana being sent off in the 81st minute. Brazil won 3-0, but the celebrating did not last long. 
they would now face France in the quarterfinals. But it was not to be. The faces back home said it all. France had knocked Brazil out. As the plane returned the Brazilian team to their home base, fans were still waiting behind barricades to glimpse their fallen heroes. The match against France had been a close run thing. Brazil had had most of the play, but it had been fierce. Seven yellow cards had been given. At the interval, the game was deadlocked at nil all. In the 57th minute, Thierry Henry kicked the only goal, sending Brazil home. Manager Carlos Alberto Pereira was already facing a barrage of criticism by the Brazilian media for sticking to an outdated brand of football. It was also suggested that he had not used the players available to him properly. After two more weeks, he tendered his resignation, which was accepted. Key attacking player Ronaldo had only scored once in the tournament, while Ronaldinho had not scored at all. Fans still believed that their team was the best in the world, but were turning against the manager as well. It was an ignominious end for Pereira, who had taken Brazil to victory in the 1994 World Cup, and in his second stint as manager, to victory in the 2005 Confederations Cup. Back at the team hotel, about 500 fans gathered outside as the bus made its way along the street. Some had come to Gia, but most were still cheering their beloved team. Others just wanted to commiserate with their national symbols. What was missing for Brazil? It was a shame. Pereira did not train the team enough. Since the first match, we could have realised that Brazil was not well prepared to win this World Cup. The sense of Brazilian pride was still in the air. If anyone can draw the limelight from Kaká, it's his Brazilian teammate, Ronaldinho. They both play big parts at top clubs. Though they have different styles, people draw parallels between the two superstars because they are match winners. Ronaldinho is known for his runs, passes and feints. While Kaká's shooting and his ability to perform under pressure change games. Ronaldinho speaks well of his Brazilian teammate. Kaká is a magical footballer who creates moments of inspiration. As well as being a superb passer of the ball, he can run past players, shoot and score. And Kaká thinks highly of Ronaldinho. Ronaldinho on the ball is different from all others. He can put the ball wherever he wants. I'd like to have that quality. After the 1994 World Cup, Football aficionados started claiming that the beautiful game had ended. But players like Kaká and Ronaldinho with their flamboyant, surprising styles have stopped talk about the demise of the beautiful game. The friends' careers have striking similarities. For 2006, FIFPRO, the worldwide organization for professional football players, voted Ronaldinho as the best player for the second year running. He shared his thoughts on several players who could grab the top position in the following year. First, Lionel Messi. Without a doubt, he's doing very well right now, growing with every game he plays and every new month. Leo has many qualities. For me, they would start with his speed while on the ball. I love players who always look to dribble the ball, take on men one-on-one. -on -one. That, for me, is one of the main weapons he has as a player. Champions League finalist Steven Gerrard was another who caught Ronaldinho's eye. The Liverpool captain is considered to be one of the world's best midfielders. 
Yes, that's the way I think about him. He has a huge impact. For me, in the position he plays, he's one of the very best in the world. For the job he performs, for me, he's one of the greatest. Portuguese winger Cristiano Ronaldo had already won the English PFA award and Ronaldinho admired his skills. He's another very great player, very young too, but with a style of playing that I really love. For me, he's one of the footballers who has been in the best form recently. And finally, his Brazilian teammate Kaká. Kaká is in brilliant form now. He's reached the final and been playing so well. So it's a real joy for me to see him in such form. Every year he seems to improve. Every year that goes by he's learning more and more. Each year he's improving a lot. For 2007, Kaká was holding the Fifth Pro Award. Because this award is given as a result of voting by players, it is one of the most highly valued prizes in football. It's a special thing to be elected by my fellow players, the men on the field who really understand the game from the inside. They're not coaches, they're not journalists, they're players who voted for me to have this award. I'm very honoured to receive this award. Voting is for the best player in a particular position, and a World Eleven is announced. Lionel Messi, Steven Gerrard, Cristiano Ronaldo and Ronaldinho were all there. I think it would be very hard for a player playing in South America or Latin America to win this award. What you do there is restricted to that area. It's not well known worldwide. For example, Riquelme was a great influence during Copa Libertadores, but what he did stayed in Latin America. What he did in Europe was appreciated by a much wider audience. Asia, Japan, the Middle East, worldwide. That's why the Champions League is so important. The Ballon d'Or is an annual award presented to the person judged best player of any nationality and from any club around the world. A panel of 96 international journalists chose their top five players, and for 2007, Kaká received the trophy. He joined a list of illustrious players who had also won the Ballon d'Or, including two years previously, his friend Ronaldinho. <laughs> Rather than keep it at home, he gave the trophy to Renascem Cristo Church in Sao Paulo so more people could see it. April 2007 saw Kaká's AC Milan in Munich for the second leg match in the quarterfinals of the UEFA Champions League. In the first leg at the San Siro, Kaká had missed an easy shot on goal from point blank range. In the 84th minute, he made amends. After breaking through on the left, he was fouled and scored from the spot to put the Rossignere in front. It was Daniel van Boyten who scored the equaliser, but in the second leg before their home crowd, Bayern Munich went down to Milan 2-0. One month later, AC Milan were in Athens for the final against Liverpool. Theodorus Zakarakis, captain of Greece's national team that brought home the European Cup in 2004, officially opened the festival at the Panathinaikos Stadium. To get to the final, Rossonieri had defeated Manchester United twice, with Kaká scoring three goals. It was Liverpool's second Champions League final in three years. But after extra time in the second leg of their semi-finals against Chelsea, there was still no result. The outcome was decided in Liverpool's favour after a penalty shootout. There was strong feeling between the two sides going into this match. 
AC Milan was still smarting after defeat by Liverpool in the Champions League final in Istanbul two years before. Fans were arriving from across Europe and some were willing to pay big money for tickets. Prices as high as 10 times the value were being asked and were being paid. The match would be at Athens' new Olympic Stadium with a capacity of close to 75,000. For the thousands that would not be able to find tickets, Athens had provided several areas with big screens. The warm weather suited the Liverpool fans' fondness for refreshment and the pre-match festivities around Syntagma Square continued to build in intensity. Both Milan and Liverpool arrived two days before the game and would have separate training sessions at the Olympic Stadium. For security reasons, both teams were staying in hotels in southern Athens, away from the activity in the heart of the city. Fans established rival areas on opposite sides of the main square where they sang team songs. The rivalry was generally good-natured. Both fans were confident of a win, with Milan fans saying it would not be a repeat of Istanbul in 2005 where Liverpool won on penalties. At half-time, Milan had been in front three goals to nothing. Amongst the Rossinieri fans, support for Kaka was prominent. Uh, I remember very well uh, uh, Istanbul. Tonight, uh, the first Liverpool will uh, remember very well uh, Atene. Many of the fans without tickets would spend the evening watching the match in their hotels or bars and cafes. At the Olympic Stadium, Liverpool trained first. Both Liverpool and AC Milan have been prominent since the Champions League's earliest days in the 1950s. Going into this match, Liverpool had won the title five times and AC Milan had won it six times. Liverpool had earned the right to play in their traditional red strip, while AC Milan would play in their white away strip. Every time Liverpool had won this cup, they were in their home strip and had been playing against the team wearing white. At the pre-match press conference, Rafael Benitez said the clubs knew each other well. His team would stick to its zonal defence and would not single out individuals to mark opponents. I think it would be tough, no? you know, always uh, this, uh, the finals, the last final two years ago was uh, amazing. No? And for me, it was the best final in the, in the history of this competition. No? Then I don't think that we will see a game like this. If you say to me, you want to, uh, to see this kind of game, if uh, the final score is the same, yes. But if, if not, I will need a doctor. No? Then I prefer to, to think about it will be a tough game, difficult game for both. And OK, we will see. I don't think that we will see a lot of goals. The Liverpool team was very aware that so far in the tournament, the highest scorer was Kaká. Not only had he put the ball into the net ten times, but he had had a hand in many other goals as well. Liverpool's Norwegian midfielder, Jean Aneris, who had played in the 2005 victory over AC Milan, was asked about Kaká. He's the top scorer of the Champions League. Uh, he's one of the, the best players in the world, but we are thinking about ourselves first of all, and then uh, we know Milan got great players who can finish the game off. So it's not only about Kaká, but obviously we have to, to try our best to stop him as well. For the Milan team seeking a different outcome to their last Champions League meeting with Liverpool, the stadium was considered lucky. It was here that the Rossignere had beaten FC Barcelona 4-0 in the 1994 UEFA Champions League final. And AC Milan did not see their white strip as a bad omen. Five of their Champions League Cups had been won wearing the white strip. As he trained, Captain Paolo Maldini showed no signs of trouble from the knee injury that had plagued him all season. In playing this match, the 38-year-old would equal the record of Real Madrid legend Paco Gento's eighth final appearance. During the team's last meeting in Istanbul, Maldini scored the fastest goal ever in the final, finding the back of the net in the first minute.
Carlo Ancelotti's side were marginal favourites, but Liverpool was aiming to defeat the Rossignere twice in a row. Neither Ancelotti nor Benitez would take anything for granted. On the evening of May 23, 2007, the citizens of Milan gathered around big screens in the cathedral square. They were keen to see their team make amends for the Istanbul defeat. At the end of the first half, they scored. Kaka had been brought down on the edge of the box and the resulting free kick had gone in off Inzaki. In the 82nd minute, Kaka threaded a pass to Inzaki who scored a second goal, putting the result beyond doubt. Shortly after, Kurt scored a consolation goal for Liverpool, but at the final whistle, Milan was victorious. Kaka had been the tournament's highest scorer and was named the competition's best player. Further, he won the title as UEFA's Club Forward of the Year and Club Footballer of the Year. Immediately after the game, the team was swamped with well-wishers. Among them, Silvio Berlusconi. Celebrations continued well into the night, but for Kaka's triumphant AC Milan, there was more hard work and more glory to come. At the end of 2007, the Rossignere were in Yokohama for the semi-final of the Club World Cup. The team was preparing for a meeting with top Japanese club, the Uwara Reds. The winners would gain a berth in the finals. AC Milan had never won this tournament and were keen to add the new trophy to the collection. But distracting rumours suggested that manager Carlo Ancelotti would be replaced at the end of the season. At the end of the match, deflated Red fans were leaving the Yokohama International Stadium. Milan had triumphed 1-0 and would face South American champions Boca Juniors for the final. Plenty of Milan fans were there to enjoy their team's success. I think, I think that we are better than Boca, and so I think that we will win uh, this cup. In 2003, Boca and AC Milan had met in the Intercontinental Cup, the forerunner to this championship. Boca Juniors had won that game on penalties. Three days later, in the Argentine capital, Buenos Aires fans watched the final unfold. Rodrigo Palacio had just scored the equaliser for Boca and at half-time, scores stood at 1-1. For a country like Argentina that supplies so many of the world's top players, this was a rare occasion to have a local team go head-to-head -head on the international stage. But in the second half, things did not go Boca's way. At the final whistle, Milan were two goals in front and had taken the World Club Cup 4-2. Stunned Boca fans graciously showed their appreciation of a very open match. Kaká again demonstrated that the beautiful game was still alive. After scoring one goal and playing a major role in two of his team's other goals, Kaká was named Man of the Match. Ever since I was a child, I've watched this championship. We all prepared well this week, the whole squad. It was important to arrive in Japan early. I believe this was a result of good preparation. Unusual applause at the press conference. I think we can finally erase the bitter memories of losing to Boca in 2003 with this nice victory. Kaká delivered a wonderful performance and the fact that he won this year's Ballon d'Or gave him an extra incentive. Tonight, especially in the second half when he had more space, he proved to be decisive. Fans were jubilant that the Rossignere had finally won the Club Cup. I'm so happy. Milan is the world's number one team.
and Milan's Japanese supporters were celebrating in Italian style. Soon back in Milan, Kaká's incredibly high profile had triggered a new round of rumours about the champion's future with the Rossignere. Giorgio Armani, who had a fashion contract with the glamorous Kaká, said he would rather see the club sell the rest of Milan than part the young icon who had become so linked to Milanese culture. Kaká said he was very happy at AC Milan and that he wanted to grow old at the club. But everyone realized that Kaká was worth a great deal and that his club just might be tempted to cash in. If they did, there was little he could do about it. Stories about a £100 million transfer offer from English club Manchester City had not been denied, but Carlo Ancelotti was adamant that he did not want to lose his important playmaker. For the rest of his career at AC Milan, rumours about big money offers continued, and it became clear Kaká wanted to remain loyal to his club, but that might not be enough to keep him there. Finally, in mid-2009, the story broke in the Spanish press. AC Milan had accepted an offer in excess of 60 million euros, a new record. Kaká was going to Real Madrid, his new home would be the Bernabeu Stadium. Soon after, crowds were flocking to the stadium, not to see a match, but to be introduced to Kaká. Devout Christians were showing their appreciation. 40,000 fans flooded into the Bernabeu to see their club's expensive new acquisition. It was party time at Real Madrid. Finally, the man they'd all come to see. And the shirt they knew they'd be seeing amongst the action. It's a very special day for me to be here before you at Real Madrid. I hope I can write my name in the club's history books with victories and conquests. My desire is to have my name in the history of this club with so many victories and conquests. Kaká continues to write his own legend.